Hello everyone. This is God's solution for worry. Going to focus on the theme from fear to faith. We will be looking at the life of Gideon and we will be able to, I think, apply some great lessons from his life, not only his successes, but some of his failures we can learn from and avoid those pitfalls. I want to remind you there are many scriptures that bring great comfort and encouragement to us. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And I want to read some scriptures to you that we haven't used in our study to, to this point. Uh, Psalms 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalms 34, 4 and 5. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. The more we focus on the promises of God and remind God that we are standing on his promises, the more he is pleased. And we can encourage others with uh, the comfort that God gives us as we remember what he has promised to do. We are now going to focus on Gideon. And it's extremely important that we understand that God had given some very, very clear commandments to Israel. Uh, they were God's chosen people and they were promised that if they obeyed him, kept his commandments, they would be richly blessed. And Deuteronomy 10, 12 uh, is one of those important verses to look at. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And the next one is Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Two things we want to focus on right now is the commandment to love God, and we know we're commanded to love him with all of our heart, and to fear him. And the concept of fear is confusing to a lot of people, and it's, I think, misinterpreted at times. But we need to know that there's a reason that God commands both love and fear. God is the creator of the universe. He created us, and he created spiritual laws. Let's examine that. Why does God require love and fear? The scripture says to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. And Jesus' own words in John uh, 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So when a person truly has the love that God has required us to have for him, we will put the interest of that uh, person or being ahead of our own. We will desire to please and do our very best for him. And that is why God created in us a desire to love and be loved. That's part of the human nature that God has given us. The subject of fear is brings up a lot of questions and difficulties for some people, but I want to try to explain the role that fear plays a positive role in our relationship with God. There is something about fear, and we want to look at some scriptures to understand what benefit for a follower of God to have a reverential fear of God, and we're going to read scriptures that will clearly state this. Proverbs 16, 6. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Proverbs 9, 10. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy is understanding. 1 Corinthians 1.24 Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, Christ is the wisdom of God. If we truly are seeking true, the true wisdom of God, it will bring us to Christ, which will bring us to salvation and a personal relationship with him and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Fear is one of those things that will cause us when we understand that a holy God, a holy and righteous God, requires punishment for sin, if you put your faith in Christ, Christ took your punishment on himself when he was on the cross. That, in turn, gives us a pardon, forgiveness of sin, adoption into the family of God, the greatest gift that has ever been given, and we need to really understand that this then overwhelms the dread of being in God's presence, but longing to be in God's presence because we are now a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out fear. The dread of being in God's presence is taken away. We long to be in his presence if we are in the right relationship with him. And then the next verse, 19, we love him because he first loved us. So you can see the overriding presence of love pushing that dread, that fear out of your heart. But the foundation of our relationship with God is fear. I clearly remember vividly when I was 10 years of age, I blurted out in a family Bible lesson and it said, I wanted to be saved. Now, why did I do that? I did not want to end in the lake of fire. And I think that this, I'm not alone, but I think many people, when they understand the consequence of a holy God demanding righteousness, and we have utterly failed, we need a Savior. We need the one that paid our debt on the cross, whereby we are forgiven and adopted into that family of God. After that long introduction, we're going to get to Gideon. And we want to pose the question, why did God choose Gideon? The reason God chose Gideon is quite obvious. Not only was Gideon flawed, but he was fearful and he was weak and he recognized his weak. And you say, well, why would God choose someone like that to be used in this great assignment to deliver Israel. Now, you must remember that Israel was a constant failure to keep God's commandments, and now they had had 40 years of rest, and what happens? The next generation rebels against God, and God sends great difficulty to Israel through the Midianites and the Amalekites, and they suffered greatly. Now, Gideon is hiding, living in a cave somewhere, threshing wheat at night so that it wouldn't be stolen by the enemy. Yet, God chooses to use the weak and foolish things of the world. And I want to share with you the scripture from 1 Corinthians. And this gives you and me hope, especially myself, how God can take someone as flawed as I am and give me an opportunity to depend on his strength and, and uh, hopefully glorify his name. Beginning at verse 26 in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and that God has chosen the weak things of the world 
to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things that are despised by the world, God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And don't forget 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. When we do have successes, we want to give him the honor and praise. The closing scripture that I want to use that really gives hope is when Gideon questions God's choice of him, being the youngest of his family, being of a tribe that was small in Israel, and the angel of the Lord who had appeared to him says, surely I will be with you and you will defeat Midian as one man. In conclusion, we must focus on the promises of God. Focus on that phrase, surely I will be with you. There are many, many verses that we can use. Let's close in a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would take my flawed delivery, and turn it into a challenging message for all of us, myself especially, Lord, that we can be totally dependent on you for wisdom, power, and strength to do the work that you are calling us, wherever it is, however it is, and even to be a witness, a bold witness for Christ. In Jesus' name, Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Until next time, God bless.